If you have a scheduled deliverance, being nervous is normal. In fact, I tell people when they have a scheduled deliverance, be ready to be nervous. Be ready for that day. Everything in you do not want you to come get delivered. The spirits in you, they know that you're getting deliverance that day. So they're making you nervous. They're making you sick to your stomach. They're making your heart race. Some of you are nervous every time I talk about deliverance because there's spirits in you. When I got born again, I had every ungodly desire you can think of, every demon you can think of. And when I got born again, I lost those desires of the flesh. I lost the desire to watch pornography. I lost the desire to look at women like they're a piece of meat and drink and party and get into debauchery and witchcraft and all the stuff I was doing. I lost that desire. My flesh was crucified with Christ and I overcame that desire and I don't have it. And then I went through deliverance because once you get in the ministry of deliverance, you'll realize that yes, even Christians need deliverance. I'm feeling fired up tonight. Demons right now are absolutely hating this broadcast. They're absolutely angry that you're listening to this. They're angry that you're listening to me. They hate that you follow me and they hate deliverance teaching. Hello everyone, welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Today we're going to be talking about the slavery of the deliverance ministry because deliverance ministers are actually keeping Christians in bondage. They are robbing Christians of their freedom. So we're going to be talking about that today. Now, Christ has come to set his people free. Christ wants to give you assurance, not through going to constant exorcisms to get demons driven out of you, but through the gospel, through the objective fact that he has already reconciled you to God. He's already forgiven your sins. And that is done because of his death, burial, and resurrection. It's an objective fact. He has reconciled you to himself, and he wants to give you freedom. He doesn't want to keep you in bondage. These guys, they want to keep you in bondage. Now, I thought I would give you an example of how this works, because um, you can go on any of the Demon Slayer's channels. You can go on Vlad Savchuk's channel or Isaiah Saldivar's or Mike Signorelli's or whoever, and you can find videos like this. I'm going to take an example from one of Isaiah's uh, most popular videos. Uh, the video is called Demons Would Hate You to Watch This, How Demons Actually Work. That video has over 715,000 views and almost 5,000 comments the last time I looked at it. But this is a very good example of how deliverance ministers aren't really setting Christians free. They're actually keeping them in bondage, making Christians think they have demons. That is not true. When Christ set you free, you were free indeed. All right. You don't have to worry about being enslaved to a demon. Demons can't enslave you, Christian. You cannot be <laughs> enslaved or indwelt by a demon. Now, in all, in all fairness, they would not say Christians can be possessed by demons, but they're still saying that demons can indwell the body of a Christian. That is absolutely impossible cannot happen. Don't believe it. We're going to talk about uh, how these guys keep you in bondage today, and we're going to do that through this Isaiah Saldivar video. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Now, he's going to give five um, tactics of how demons work. I'm only going to cover three because some of the things he says in this video is correct, uh, but I want to talk about the ones that are most problematic. And I'll go ahead and put the link to his video down in the YouTube description if you want to go and, and watch that for yourself. So we're going to look at three, maybe four of these um, tactics that the devil uses. And uh, let's start with the first one, temptation. Watch. One is temptation. Now, I believe demons are the number one thing responsible for people's temptations. Now we know that Judas was tempted. We know that Peter was tempted. We know that Ananias was tempted. All three of them had demonic activity working in their lives. Now demonic temptation, if you're taking notes, is much stronger than the temptation of the flesh. De demonic temptation also usually brings about perversion. So if you're wondering, is the temptation demonic or is it my flesh? 
The demonic temptation will bring perverted things, okay? What is perversion? Perversion means, write this down, the wrong version. Let me give you an example. Sex in marriage is God's version of marriage, of sex, okay? God's version is sex in marriage. God created it and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Sex outside of marriage is perversion. It's the wrong version of sex. It's fornication. It's wrong. Now, what is what makes it wrong? It's perversion. It's the wrong version, okay? Again, when you're talking, I gotta be careful here because I'll get my video flagged and taken down and they won't post it to people. But anytime you think of perverted desires or temptations, that's a demon tempting you. Usually, the flesh does not give you perverted desires, okay? So if you're having desires for the same sex, that's usually a demon tempting you because the flesh inherently is not attracted to the same sex. Are you guys seeing this? That's perversion. A again, the temptation a demon brings is a pulling rather than a desire. When you're, a demon is tempting you, it literally feels like something is pulling you or forcing you to do something. And if that's the case, it's usually not the flesh. And I remember now, you're like, how are you so good at this? How do you know this? Because I remember before I got delivered from the spirit of lust, I was an un, when I was an unbeliever, not wanting to do certain things, like I literally didn't want to do certain things, but I felt like there was a chain around me and I felt pulled to do things. I, I felt pulled to drink. I felt pulled to engage in sexual immorality. And I, I would do this and come on, everybody in the chat knows what I'm about to say. You would do that. You would watch the pornography, whatever it was. And then you'd bang your head on your, t on your desk or whatever it was. And you'd say, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing this again. You'd go out and drink and you'd say, I'm never doing this again. I would never do this again. I'm never doing this again. And then that demon would bring you right back. And the next night you would do it and you'd say, I'm never doing this again. Why do you live in that cycle? It's because it's a demon dragging you it's a demon pulling you to do the thing okay so he says that i believe demons are the number one things responsible for people's temptations now certainly satan tempts we all know that the bible makes that clear but to say that that's the number one reason for temptation ignores what james says james says in james 1 13 through 14 let no one say when he is tempted I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So James says that by our own desire, God, or, or I'm sorry, uh, we are tempted. Not always by a demon doesn't always happen uh, by the devil. Now, certainly, we, we do fight the unholy trinity as Christians. We fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. But we fight the flesh, all right? Jesus says this. Listen to this, Matthew 15, 17 through 19. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So, yeah, I mean, that's what comes out of the heart of the person. And we're talking about that's what's in a person. Sin. <laughs> and we fight the flesh, and we fight uh, uh, the devil, and we fight the world. Yes, all of this is true. And yes, Satan tempts, but to say again that that is the number one and main reason why there are temptations is to ignore what James and Jesus both say about the flesh, and that is that we are constantly fighting the flesh. Now, he goes on to say, demonic temptation is much stronger than temptation of the flesh. Now, watch his, what he says here. Demonic temptation usually brings about perversion. He says, what does perversion mean? Perversion means the wrong version. Anytime you think of perverted desires, that is a demon, demon tempting you. And why is that? He says, usually be, the, the flesh does not give you perverted desires. What? Scripture makes it clear that it is the flesh that brings these perverted desires. Um, again, out of the heart come all of these things, Jesus said. I just read that. Out of the heart comes what? Evil thoughts? 
I mean, evil, perver that's perverse thoughts, right? Murder, is that not perverse? Adultery, is that not perverse? Sexual immorality, is that not perverse? Now, the problem with this teaching, uh, there's a lot of problems with it, but one of the main problems is that Isaiah is not backing up his claims that demons work like this with Scripture. He gives a little bit of Scripture throughout this video, but he gives very little. No, his claims are backed up by his experiences, the experience that's he, that he's had with people who have Christians that have been demon-possessed. And one good example of that is where he talks about how he didn't want to engage in lust, but he felt something pulling him towards it. And so because he didn't want to do it, well, that had to be a demon. And yet, what do we find the Apostle Paul saying in Romans 7, 14 through 25? He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Not a demon that dwells within me, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin, not a demon, that dwells within me. So I find this, or, or I find it to be a law, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So Isaiah talks about this pull. He says it has to be a demon because I didn't want to do it. I, it wasn't me that wanted to do it, so I felt this pull. It had to be a demon. Well, the Apostle Paul says the same thing, but he says it's him. He says it's sin dwelling in him, not a demon. Number one was temptation. Number two is disruption. Demons disrupt. They want to cause disruption in your marriage. Now, disruption, the definition is disturbance or problems which interrupt an event, an activity, or a process. Okay, so demons will entice you to make bad decisions to interrupt what God is doing in your life. They want to interrupt what God is doing. They want to move things around. They want to disrupt things. They want to disrupt relationships. They want to disrupt marriages. They want to disrupt families. We have almost 3,000 of you watching tonight. They want to bring disruption. They want to cause issues for you at work, issues for you in your marriage, issues for you with your kids. And demons actually do work harder when they're in, um, are in Christians to do this. Because remember, a demon is less incentivized to ruin an unsaved person's life because the person already belongs to them. So there's no incentive for a demon to ruin someone's life that already belongs to them. All right, so how then do we know, <laughs> according to this teaching, whether the issues or disruptions or demons are just plain old regular everyday problems that are promised to come into our lives? Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Folks, we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world, so there's going to be problems. There's going to be issues. There's going to be problems with people at work. There's going to be problems with family members, problems with children, because we have to deal with sinners every single day. We're not to be trying to figure out whether the issues that's going on in our life, all this disruption is coming from a demon. We just try to obey Scripture and do what Scripture tells us to do. I mean, I think about that passage in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking about how the Corinthians were suing one another, taking each other to court. And Paul was like, shouldn't you guys just have let yourselves be defrauded? I mean, that's what Christians do. We humble ourselves and we just take it sometimes, right? And that's because we live in a fallen world. Folks, we don't have to sit and wonder, is this a demon? 
Is this demon disrupting my life? Oh, I got to decree and declare. No, no, just do what scripture says. Humble yourself and, and, and try to obey and do what the Bible tells you to do in whatever situation you might be in. Demons and unbelievers usually only start working when someone starts sharing the gospel. So if a demon is in an unbeliever, it's usually not working very hard because it already owns the person. It'll only start working hard when the gospel starts getting shared with them. That's when all hell breaks out. Okay, now I read this article of a non-Christian psychologist. Listen to what I'm about to say. A non-Christian psychologist sitting in a deliverance session where they were delivering a believer. And this is what it, the article said. A non-Christian psychologist observed a session with a demonized Christian and asked the demon why he would live in the Christian woman rather than in him, the non-Christian psychologist. The reply from the demon was, you are no interest to me because you already belong to the evil one. Evil is within you deeply rooted. The demon even gave the name of the four demons living within the man. So the demon called out the psychologist telling the names of the demons that lived in the man. Referring to the demonized Christian, the demon said, I'm interested in getting her and possessing her um, because she she belongs to God. I'm interested in destroying her, tormenting her so she doesn't pray, she doesn't seek God, she'll, she'll fall away from God. And listen to what the demon said, she'll fall away from God and be like the rest of them. I'm in her mind, not within her, but I'm inside of her mind. That was a demon speaking out of someone to a non-Christian psychologist. But this just shows us the intentions of the demons. Now, can demons lie? Yes, but this is concurrent with scripture. Jesus didn't tell the demon when it said, my name is Legion, you're a lying demon. I hear people all the time say, don't talk to demons, they just lie. Demons have the ability to tell the truth. We know that because when Jesus talked to the demon at the tombs, Jesus didn't rebuke the demon from lying because the demon wasn't lying, okay? So you gotta remember, demons seek to disrupt Christians. So as you can see there, Isaiah is basing his teaching not on scripture, but on an article that the story may or may not be true as far as that the, the, the situation. Now, what is not true if there was a psychiatrist talking to a woman who was supposedly demon possessed? What is not true is if that woman was possessed, she was not a Christian because Christians cannot be demon possessed. All right. Or and they would again, they would say. And we've talked about this here before, but they would say that demons can't possess Christians because Christians are possessed by God. But demons can be, or Christians can be demonized. They can still have demons indwelling them. You see, they they hold to this uh, view of trichotomy, which says that man is body, soul, and spirit. And so because man is tripart, right, body, soul, and spirit, the Holy Spirit only lives in the spirit part, all right? He doesn't live in the rest of the body. He, he dwells there in the spirit. So the demon can live inside of the body, all right? And, and so that, that's how they go with that. But that is just not true. And we have talked about that uh, over and over again here on this channel. And again, I will put a link to a video, two videos that Dawn Hill and I did on this very topic. Don used to teach this stuff. So I'll put a, a video link again to two of those videos down in the YouTube descriptions. Description. I want to read a passage because I think this is really important. A passage of scripture in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. This is what it says. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the spirit and watch this. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the desires are coming from the flesh, right? For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. 
I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are things of the flesh, folks. Like Jesus said, out of the heart comes evil things, adultery, murder, fornication, all this other kind of stuff, right? That's part of the flesh, all right? That is, that is part of the sinful nature. So these aren't demons. And, and remember what Isaiah said in the temptation, first, the first clip we watched on temptation. Demons are the ones that are causing you to do this because you don't really want to do this if you're a Christian. Well, Paul says here that the Spirit is against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. As a Christian, now you have new desires. You don't want to do the things you used to do. That's part of it, but you still have to fight the old man that is there dwelling within you, right? And that's what it is. Now, we're going to watch uh, another clip here, and this clip is uh, talking about the tactic of ignorance. Watch. Number three, a, a tactic of demons is ignorance. Oh, man, you're preaching strong tonight, Isaiah. Ignorance. This is a major strategy, and this is a strategy of demons to keep you ignorant of their presence and their activities. Demons don't want you to know that they are there. They hide in darkness. I can't count how many times I started casting out a demon and the demon said, how did you know we are here? Or I'll literally be talking to someone and the demon will tell them he knows about us. He knows we're here because demons are hiding. They play on ignorance. Ignorance is a, a major strategy of demons. They don't want you to know about them. In fact, let me just say this. Demons right now are absolutely hating this broadcast. They're absolutely angry that you're listening to this. They're angry that you're listening to me. They hate that you follow me and they hate deliverance teaching. Demons absolutely hate deliverance teaching. They don't want you listening to this. They don't want you following this. And they're mad that you're in this broadcast tonight because you gotta understand they wanna keep you ignorant. Now, if you're ignorant, you're not gonna fight against them. Yeah, if you're ignorant, you're not gonna fight against them and you're not gonna get deliverance. That's what these guys want. Okay, the, the, the whole premise, this, this whole teaching, especially this part right here, is based on the false idea that Christians can have indwelling demons or that every problem that a Christian has is because of a demon. And no, Isaiah, the devil could care less about your little podcast he, he he's probably loving your podcast because you're keeping people in bondage you're not setting them free it's just this is just such bad teaching folks and again what is he basing his teaching on is he basing his teaching on scripture or his personal experiences again he does this throughout he adds little bits of scripture here and there, but his main, um, his main defense comes from his own experiences. I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, I, the, the demon has said things like, oh, he knows we're here. <laughs> I mean, this whole premise is based on, the, his whole teaching is based on the idea that Christians ha can have indwelling demons. So the whole foundation is flawed. So you don't have to listen to this guy. This guy is absolutely wrong when it comes to his teaching on demons. So demons, here's what they do. They piggyback on problems rather than create new problems so that they can hide effectively. And this way you not think that you had demons. Now I knew I had demons because I was having the most bizarre, bizarre thoughts ever and the demons gave themselves away. Now if the demons weren't giving me these incredibly bizarre perverted thoughts, they would have probably got away with it. But because they were giving me those thoughts, I already knew that it was a demon. So, so understand that they gave themselves away. So you have to understand that if a person could explain the problem away with natural reasons, the demon's able to hide in the problem. So if you can say, oh, this is why I'm anxious. This is why I have fear or addiction. I'm just going to be that way forever. Demons love this because they hide. And I can't count how many pastors I've heard say, oh, I just struggle with depression and anxiety and this and that. And it's, I'm just going to be this way. It's the way God wants me. Demons love that because they hide in the problems. And then you think the problems, I hope I'm not going too deep here, but you think the problems are natural. So you never try to get delivered. Demons love, write this down. Demons love working behind the scenes. All right. So 
Isaiah said, goes back to this whole idea again that he was talking about in the first clip on temptation that he knew that he had demons and demons gave themselves away because they're so dumb they they started bringing perverse thoughts and just crazy thoughts and in, in isaiah's head so i knew they were a demon you know they, they gave themselves away so he kind of again um going back to that same idea that uh just because i have a perverse thought or some weird thought doesn't stem from my own heart it doesn't stem from my sinful flesh from my old man what it stems from is from a demon it comes from a demon and then he talked about uh you know the struggles with depression and anxiety and, and, he, and he mentioned pastors i can't tell you how many times i've heard a pastor say well you know i just struggle with depression it's what i have to is what i am you know it's what i do look that is also a part of our sinful or because of our sinful nature just because someone struggles with depression or anxiety doesn't mean it's a demon if that were the case the psalms would have never been written have you ever read the psalms the psalms are filled with you know off the authors who have struggled with things like depression and fear and anxiety I want to give you one example from David in Psalm 13. Listen to this. All right. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep. The sleep of death lest my enemy say i have prevailed over him lest my foes rejoice because i am shaken but i have trusted in your steadfast love my heart shall rejoice in your salvation i will sing to the lord because he has been or he has dealt bountifully with me so what is it that causes david to come out of that anxiety out of that depression it is clinging to the promises of God. He says, I have trusted in your steadfast love. That's a promise that he's trusting in. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, clinging to the promise, which causes him to get out of that anxiety and depression and sing to the Lord because of God's dealing bountifully with him. They love pushing people to react in dysfunctional ways, and then they encourage you to blame yourself. They say, oh, that's not you. That's not a demon, that's just you. Demons love this, they love this, okay? There's a, now, now here's the thing you have to remember about demons. There's a constant balancing act with demons to not overplay their hand. So they'll hide for years, only to surface at the right opportune time. Now why, if there's a demon in me, why doesn't it just always have me lusting or always have me drinking or always have me angry or always have me just nonstop violent? Because I would know it's a demon and I would go seek deliverance. Now, a lot of people that come to church are coming that are extremely demonized and they come and they say, I need help because I'm addicted to alcohol. Most people come to church because they have a need. They need to get healed. They need to get help because they're alcoholic. They need to get help because they beat their wife. And so the demon literally drives them to the cross. And I thank the devil sometimes for all the issues in my life because it drove me to the cross. Remember, Satan walked Jesus to the cross. Are you guys with me tonight? Satan brought Jesus to the cross. So it wasn't God that brought Jesus to the cross. It was the devil literally and the bible says if the principalities knew what they were doing they would have never killed him they would have never crucified him so satan brought jesus to the cross and satan oftentimes will bring people to the cross by oh i love this preaching by overplaying his hand so he has to be careful okay let's start with the last statement that it was satan that brought jesus to the cross god didn't bring jesus to the cross um yeah Satan, God may allow Satan to stir up what was going on there with the crowds and with Pilate and with uh, the, the Jews. But let me tell you something. God brought Jesus to the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did this. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So God did this to save humanity, to save you. And if God didn't do it, then you would still be in your sin and you would be cast into hell for all eternity. So yes, God did do it. So you see how this kind of teaching keeps the Christian that is following these guys reliant on them. They constantly have to get exercised. They constantly have to have demons cast out of them. And even the demon slayers themselves talk about getting demons cast out of them. So they themselves are enslaved to this kind of teaching. Number seven, um, strategy of the devil. I hope you're getting help tonight in deliverance. I hope this is helping you and understanding the strategies and whether demons are there or not, okay? Number seven, are you ready? Convincing you it's you. Oh man, preach brother Isaiah, convincing you that it's just you. The demons will give you thoughts and they'll make you think the thoughts that they're giving you are your thoughts. They'll give you desires and make you think that they're your desires. They'll give you emotions and they'll make you think that they're your emotions. Now, when I went and got deliverance, my sister delivered me. I sat there and I was at work and I had this thought, again, so perverted, so grotesque. And I instantly knew, wait a minute, I don't want to do that with that thing or that person. I don't want to. So I knew the thought was not my thought. The devil wants you to think your anxiety, your stress, your anger, your suicidal thoughts are normal and it's just you. So what demons do is they convince you that their voice is actually your voice. So once again, if you're having a really wicked, perverted thought, it has to be a devil. It doesn't, it's not coming from your heart. And yet we go back to Romans 7 and we look at verses 21 through 25 where Paul says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Body of death. He's not talking about a body that is demon-possessed here. He's talking about a body that has sin dwelling in it that he has to fight constantly. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Folks, everything that Isaiah said in the clips that I showed you was all law. There was no good news. There was no gospel there, only law. But the law doesn't give us the power to live the Christian life. The gospel does that. When we understand that everything that God requires from us, from his law, everything that he requires from us to be saved has already been done, has already been accomplished. When we understand that all of our sins have already been punished by Christ, at the cross, absorbed into himself, when we understand that we were reconciled to God 2,000 years ago because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that gives us the power to live the Christian life. How? Because our sins have been removed. John 1, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ's death took away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, listen to this, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us, that's the apostles, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
So in that passage, you see two things. You see the objective reconciliation of the world and the subjective reconciliation of the person who has faith in Christ. Christ has redeemed and reconciled the world to himself. That's an objective fact. And by the hands of faith, we reach out and we receive what Christ has won for us there at the cross. Romans 5, 10 through 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have now received reconciliation. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Christ reconciled you. You are free. You don't have to worry about demons and going, getting demons expelled. No, you have been forgiven. God has given you his Holy Spirit to indwell you, not just one part of you, but all of you. No demon's going to live where the Holy Spirit is living. I want to read a couple of quotes by C.F.W. Walther. He was a Lutheran theologian. These quotes from Walther are so good. Listen to what he says here. Suppose a mob of rebels has been condemned to death. The king, seeing that they were all misled, resolves to pardon them. He draws up a document with his seal and his signature that says they are all pardoned. Then he sends someone into the city where the rebels are, with a command that he announce to them that they can be happy and rejoice, for the rebellion will have no evil results for them. The king has pardoned them. Here is the document. In such a case, would the rebels first be required to do something to make this document a gracious forgiveness? No, that is already present. They do not have to manufacture grace through their own conduct, for it is already present. They are only to believe what has been announced to them, and thereby become recipients of that gracious pardon. Just so, every preaching of the gospel is an absolution that God himself speaks to everyone who hears the preaching of the gospel. Nothing is demanded of man in order to make this an act of grace, for it is already that. Unbelief is not only a hindrance that keeps people from viewing this as an act of grace, but it is the refusal to view the gospel for what it already is. Therefore, there is also no more comforting doctrine than this. Whoever grasps this doctrine properly can never, even in temptation, even in the face of death, be without comfort. Through this overwhelmingly great comfort, God comes to the rescue of all poor sinners who also, uh, all poor sinners also in the greatest need. So that's the first quote. But understand something. The gospel is proclamation. It is proclaiming something that has already happened. Christ reconciled you. Now you be reconciled to him. Take with the hands of faith all that Christ has done for you. So that's the first quote. Here's the second one. I think this is just wonderful as well. Listen. As Christ suffered, so all people suffered in him, for he suffered in their stead. As he hung on the cross, so all hung on the cross in him. As he died, we died. As he arose, we arose. When God tells us in his word, sins exclude from heaven, they must be atoned for. We can now answer, in Christ all my sins have already been atoned for. As my substitute, he has done everything necessary. When God says in his word, the law must be fulfilled, we can answer, it is already fulfilled in Christ. When God says in his word, you must die because of your sin, we can now answer, I've already died for I hold fast to your word where you say, One has died for all, therefore all have died, 2 Corinthians 5.14. When God says in his word, if you want to go to heaven, you must be righteous, we reply, Christ carried my sin into the grave and and in my stead arose righteously from the grave. He is my substitute and guarantor in his suffering, death, shedding of blood. So he is this also in his resurrection. 
God acting entirely alone has made provision that man might be justified. According to his unfathomable mercy, he sent his only begotten son into the world, laid on him the sins of the whole world, and punished them in him. So there is no sin, be it ever so great, that has not been expiated, whether it has already been committed or will still be committed. Christ has borne all of them, felt them, and has been punished for all of them. But he also kept the law perfectly, even though he was not obligated to do so. He did not lead a pious life because it is of the essence of human life to be pious. Much rather, he stood far above the law as its giver and Lord. But for us, he fulfilled the law perfectly. So the righteousness of God was acquired for us. It is finished. It is here. We don't have to go looking for Christ. We don't have to say, as Paul says in Romans chapter 10, where is he? You know, as if we have to bring Christ down. No, it's right there. Christ is here. The law has been kept. 2,000 years ago, he bled and died for you. He objectively reconciled you. All we do is believe it. And then what happens? We receive the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. And that is pure freedom. That is pure freedom. We don't have to worry anymore that Satan can grab us or get a hold of us. Sure, he can tempt us, and he can bring trials and tribulations. Absolutely, he can. But we stand against him. We don't have to worry that we're going to have a demon indwelling us, and now we have to have deliverance. We have to stand on the Word of God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Folks, it is the gospel that brings freedom. God bless every one of you. We love you. Lord willing, we'll see you next week.